My name is, <laughs> so it is indeed. My name is Frank Dirks and uh, I'm with Carolina Catholic Professionals and I'm delighted to, uh, to have you all join us for this, our final uh, First Friday gathering for uh, the spring and summer of uh, 2021. We will resume First Friday uh, lunches uh, with real lunches back at the, the, the Diocese Pastoral Center uh, starting with the first Friday of September, September 3rd. So we're very much looking forward to that. But we've learned from this experience with, uh, with uh, virtual gatherings. So we'll continue to record our first Friday gatherings and post them on the website. So if you're not able to attend, although we hope you can, uh, we certainly uh, ask that uh, you, know, you, you continue to look to our website and um, you know, catch up on the great, uh, great testimony of uh, folks who come for our first Fridays as speakers. Uh, also a couple of things for this month, just to let you know, uh, Carolina Catholic Professionals is um, hosting a gathering at the St. John Cemetery that's at the corner of the Crosstown and Cumming Street. Uh, you can find information about that on our website uh, on Thursday, June 17th at 7 p.m. Uh, we will offer a rosary and uh, in memory of the souls of um, uh, the martyrs of Mother Emanuel and the souls of St. John Cemetery. So we hope that you can join us at 7 p.m. on Thursday, June 17th for that rosary. And then also on June 27th uh, in the afternoon, Sunday, 12.30 to 5, the Fun Nun Bowl returns. Uh, we'll be gathering at the Royal Lanes uh, Family Entertainment Center in Deuce Creek and we hope that uh, you'll be able to join us for that. Fun Nun Bowl is a, is a great fellowship opportunity. It's uh, family fun. We're looking for, uh, for folks to put together teams and uh, uh, join us for that. There are lots of lanes still available. So you can find out more information about that if you want to, uh, to bowl or uh, sponsor a team um, or just sign up as part of a team. You can go to that website. And Ann Hobde uh, is... Uh, uh, helping out with that, and we're very grateful for uh, for her work in making that possible. So it's uh, a great delight, an honor, and a pleasure to uh, to have with us today Aaron and Cody Graber. They um, I know them from uh, from the cathedral. Uh, they are an extraordinary uh, uh, Catholic couple, and uh, uh, wonderful uh, uh, examples of uh, living the Catholic faith. Uh, they met as, uh, as students at Notre Dame Law School and were married in 2006. They graduated from Notre Dame Law School. And you'll notice, you know, I'm wearing the, wearing the colors here, but uh, they graduated from, uh, from Notre Dame in 2007 and moved to Charleston. Uh, they've had five children, Sean, James, Annalisa, Finbar, and Hugo. Um, and um, they have uh, been extraordinary, uh, you know, examples of uh, Catholic parents, uh, just, uh, just watching them as, uh, as a person who knows them through the, the parish, They're just uh, in, inspirational. Cody is a, uh, a public defender. He works for, um, uh, works in the federal public defense system. And Aaron started out as, a, as an attorney for Peter Shayed but now as a stay-at-home mom, and uh, together they uh, live in West Ashley, attend uh, Corpus Christi, with, which is an ordinary parish. Uh, Cody and Aaron are here to talk about not only their faith journey, but also their efforts to launch Corpus Christi Academy, which is a new uh, traditional Catholic uh, high school. So Aaron and Cody, thank you so much for joining us, and uh, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Frank. Thanks so much for inviting us to um, present and to talk and to join in fellowship with everybody here. Um, Aaron, why don't you start with your faith journey before we met? Oh, before we met, um, I am a product of public school all the way through, uh, through the, the bachelor's degree phase. Um, and I went to, I was raised Catholic, but nominally not, um, you know, we didn't do much with our faith, but when I went to a big public secular university, ironically, um, at the University of Maryland, I really 
I met a wonderful priest who's now a bishop, Bishop Byrne up in Massachusetts. He was our little college um, priest there. And I, for the first time, learned about the Catholic faith and learned the, the truth and the beauty that's in it. And um, two of my subsequent roommates ended up converting from nothing to Catholicism in the middle of this big public university. And um, at that time, I was praying a lot about our, my future and was brought to Notre Dame for law school where I met Cody and all the pieces fell into place. Over Miller Light at a bar. <laughs> Uh, I grew up in Anderson in the upstate of South Carolina. I uh, went to St. Joseph's Parish, grew up uh, in the parish there in the parish school through fifth grade. Then I went to public school for middle school, high school, went to Furman for college. Uh, and in the upstate, um, I was challenged a lot about my faith, about um, you know whether or not we worshiped Mary and was Catholicism really an occult? Um, so I was challenged a lot by Protestant friends, which gave me, I think, a good foundation in apologetics, um, but had a more deeper conversion, I think, of my heart to the faith in college. And um, that kind of led me to uh, a year of discernment, actually, and volunteered with the Diocese of Charleston here. I worked at Bishop England uh, for as with the retreat. Back then, it was the retreat team. Uh, and then also worked at the College of Charleston, just doing some faith formation and, and helped uh, teach RCIA at the Citadel. Um, I discerned that the Lord's calling for me was uh, a harder path for me, which was uh, to be a dad. Um, and uh, harder, but definitely uh, joyful. And uh, Aaron has really answered my prayers for the kind of woman that I wanted to be a partner with for the rest of my life. And um, I feel blessed every day that we're together. And, um, and I'm really glad that she's here to talk because she's really uh, the all-star of the family and um, is the backbone of a lot of the stuff that we talk about doing. She is the one that actually gets stuff done. Uh, so I, um, as Aaron said, we met at Notre Dame Law School. Um, I'm practice now um, serving the poor. Uh, as a lawyer who helps uh, poor people charged with crimes. And um, that is an interesting and challenging job at times, um, but it is very rewarding. And um, hopefully I do a good job uh, helping my clients feel loved and respected and heard, which a lot of poor people don't uh, get that opportunity. So that's a little bit of part of how I feel like my faith is lived out in my job. Um, we have been on an adventure, I would say, uh, as a family um, since our kids started to um, become at the age where they needed to be educated. And that adventure has led us uh, through a lot of different paths that were not expected for us. Um, Aaron homeschools our kids right now, um, which is we had friends in law school who were homeschoolers or who knew they wanted to be homeschoolers and we were not those people. Uh, I did not go to law school with the intention of homeschooling children, but here I am. But here she is. Yeah. Um, and maybe you can talk a little bit about that journey. Well, um, yes, like Frank said, I worked here. I, I was involved downtown, worked for Peter Shade, who a number of you know, um, and was litigating. And uh, then we started having having children, and I just really felt the call to be home with my kids, and um, irresistibly so much so that I said to Cody and to Peter one day, you know, I'm not coming back after this baby, right? And they both said, yeah, we know. Um, so we shifted things around and made it work on a public defender salary, and that was really, really a leap of faith. And at every turn, we were just provided for what we needed. Um, so when our oldest went to school, Sean is now almost 13, but when he started school, um, we tried actually a number of different schools because we were dissatisfied, to put it bluntly. We were dissatisfied with the academic product that we were getting for him and for our next son, James. Um, and there came a day where, you know, I'm at home anyway, it, with our other kids and where Cody and I said to each other, can we do it better at home? Um, and 
my sister texted me, you know, Thomas Jefferson homeschooled his children with a mere law degree. You could do it too. <laughs> and I said, okay, I will give it a try. Um, and what happened there was really interesting. We brought the kids home with a, a desire to provide more academically, but also to spend more time with our kids. We felt like we were missing them in their best hours. And we really, we really craved our kids to be together more, to know each other and to know us more and to know their home more. Um, so once they were home, we had the task of deciding what kind of education they would get. How are we going to go about this? We had the opportunity and the responsibility as parents to say, what can we do better? If we're not going to send them to school, we have to do something better. Um, and we, like typical lawyers, we just dove into the research for an entire summer of researching. You know, it was like a, a crash course in education for two of us who've never thought about it really before. And we just consumed all the books and websites and, and everything. And what we kept coming back to was this idea that we did not know about of a classical education, a classical curriculum for our kids. Um, and at the younger ages, that looks very different than at the older ages. Um, but every at every turn when we would go to share an article with each other or share a book with each other, that's what we kept coming back to is, you know, I'm reading a lot about people who are doing this with a classical curriculum and what are you reading about? And I really like the way that this sounds. So that's what we've been doing for five years. And we've been really pleased with the results in our kids and in our family and in our home. Um, at the younger ages, that looks, like I said, it looked different. There's a lot of memorizing and a lot of content in the younger ages that you use later on in the older ages. So our homeschool looks different than if our kids were to be in public school. There's a lot of memorizing math facts and dates and um, there's cursive and there's pencils and papers, not a lot of screens, a lot of books, a lot of reading time. Um, and we've just found that it's a lovely, lovely way to be for our family. Um, and it also, I think for us, has allowed us to incorporate directly, I mean, we as parents are the primary educators, right? And public schools and um, parish schools are there to assist us. Um, and uh, so that's sort of something we had to, you know, take over as well and incorporate was the faith um, for us. And what a great adventure that's been for us, especially because we can incorporate saints of the time that our kids are studying in history um, into just their normal study. And so there's this really integrated nature of, of the faith and aspects of the faith. And really saints lives for us has been a great vector uh, for our kids to learn more about the faith. Um, one of my favorite days coming home was I drove home and I saw in the yard there was a doll um, and the doll had sticks around it, and then flames had been created around the, the sticks. And sure enough, it was the Feast of St. Joan of Arc. No, we were studying the Hundred Years' War. Oh, sorry, they were studying the Hundred Years' War, so they started, um, they learned about St. Joan and about her life and about her death and recreated her death. Um, so that was, you know, the little opportunities like that, that homeschooling has been a real blessing for us and the classical education has been a blessing for us as a family um, to explore and to have that time with the kids to, um, to grow in their faith and to see their faith as an integrated part of their education and of their daily life. Um, so, our oldest son, like I said, Sean, he's almost 13. And when he, when we started thinking about high school a few years ago, um, really the next step in the classical education is the phase of discussion and rhetoric, where you need to learn how to speak and write effectively. And you do that in discussion with your peers and with expert faculty. Um, we looked around and like, <laughs> I feel like the story of education in Charleston is looking around at your options. And there's, you know, where I grew up, everybody went to the public high school. 
Um, and we don't really have that here in Charleston, right? We have uh, magnet schools and charter schools and private schools and Catholic schools and regular old public schools. Um, but when it it's time to go to high school and kindergarten, we noticed everybody looks around and says, where am I going to go? Where did you get in? Where did you get in? And we did not see the kind of education that we wanted to continue on the landscape at all. It just, it wasn't there. Um, now, for a long time, we had been friends with Father Patrick Allen, who is an ordinary priest. He converted from Anglican, an Anglican priest about maybe five or seven years ago. Eight years ago. Um, yeah. He was at Church of the Holy Communion, Anglican Church downtown, and then converted, and he has a parish called Corpus Christi, which is in the Anglican Ordinariate. And we'd been friends with him for years and had always had this ongoing conversation with Father Allen that we all had felt, call, start, call, felt called to start a school one day with each other. And, and it's so random that we, but for years we had had this conversation going. And when it came time to start looking for high school options, we sat down with him and a couple of other families who had joined in that conversation with us. And we said, you know, we've always had this dream of starting a school. And for Father Allen and I, that conversation started at least five, seven years ago as a preschool. And then it kind of morphed into an elementary school. And this was just our, our kind of nebulous conversation that we had been having. And when we sat down with these other families and we actually started to put words on paper of what we want to do and what we feel called to do, um, unilaterally around the whole table, it was secondary education. There needs to be another choice. I don't have an option for high school. I don't have another choice. And so we said, okay, we feel the same way. Um, and this has really felt like the Holy Spirit talking to us saying secondary education, Charleston needs another high school, another Catholic high school. And so that was probably two years ago. Yes. And we've just been kind of hitting the ground running ever since. Um, we, we had this desire for a classical curriculum to be offered in Charleston. Now, a few things there to unpack. Charleston does not have a classical option for high school right now. It is the fastest growing um, mode of education in the country. And Cody and I have been to several different cities Thanks. That was our three-year-old. You want to say hi? No. Okay. Um, we've been to several different cities and toured different classical high schools that we've loved and cities the size of Charleston or smaller. And we just kept coming back to like, why don't we have this here? And the, the rate of growth in Charleston, um, which we all know about, how can this not be an option? This is what parents are looking for these days. Um, also with the explosion of homeschooling and the class of how popular the classical curriculum is with homeschooling, we just thought this is what we have to do now. So first of all, the option does not exist right now in Charleston. So we felt like there's a niche that had to be filled and we were being asked to fill it. Second of all, the classical curriculum. So what does that mean for our school? What are we offering? First of all, um, the classical curriculum, like Cody said, is integrated. Uh, all of the subjects relate to each other. So if we start studying medieval times, medieval history, we are going to study Joan of Arc. In theology, we are going to pull our literature from the time of history that we're studying. The classical cur curriculum is also sequential, which means we're going to start in ancient history, and history is going to be our backbone through a four year sequential ordered curriculum. So history as the backbone, we start in ancients, we learn about ancient Rome, ancient Greece, the people who founded Western civilization. And from those people, we read our literature, we learn our math, we learn our philosophy and our theology from those people in history. Then the next year we'll move on to the medieval times, we will read Beowulf, we will study medieval hi history and theology. And then we move on into pre-modern and modern times. So 
the classical curriculum that we were looking for and that we want to create is sequential in order. It's integrated throughout subjects. And it's based primarily on great books and primary texts. In short, we will study history, not social studies. And we will study, instead of learning about what Plato wrote, we will read what Plato wrote. Instead of learning about the US Constitution, we will read the US Constitution and discuss it in a Socratic method. Anything else from you <laughs> on that note? No, and I think, um... You know, for us to um, a big question um, and need is um, for a, a an additional Catholic high school. Um, you know, our goal is frankly not to compete with Bishop England. Um, Bishop England is a very good Catholic school um, that has everything you could want. Right? Um, has a football team or has a basketball team, um, but for for some of us, it doesn't have the type and mode of education that we want for our kids. Um, and so that's part of the need, we think, for another Catholic high school. Um, but it's also a location issue. There are a lot of families in West Ashley, farther out in West Ashley and in James Island, where um, you know it's difficult to get to Daniel Island. And it's a big commitment of time um, that parents miss out on their families, uh, or kids miss out with their families um, commuting to, to Daniel Island. Um, so we're excited for kind of this startup project. Um, we really honestly feel like compelled by the Holy Spirit to, to start it. Um, there are plenty of times in the last two years when we are like, what are we doing? Why are we doing this? Can't we just send our kids to school? It would be easier. Um, but that's just not what the Lord's put on our heart and what the task that he's given us. So uh, we're excited, really excited about it. And uh, I do have a few slides to kind of show you oh, yeah, about uh, just some of the stuff we have for the school set up. Um, so I'll share right now. Um, I'm going to say two things. Okay. One is that One the, the whole, um, our whole goal in education, both at home and in creating the school, is to order our children towards the pursuit of truth, beauty, and goodness in an excellent way. So that when they grow up, they will know how to pursue those things and they will look towards those things. The second thing is more logistically. Um, when we scheduled this call, I did not realize that my children have a track meet in Myrtle Beach this afternoon. <laughs> so in a moment, I'm going to excuse myself and rejoin on audio in the car and I'll still be part of the conversation, but that's where I've gone, to Myrtle Beach. So um, here is, uh, here we go. Let's see if I can do it right. Share screen. All right, can everybody see? Can I get a thumbs up? You guys can see that the share was successful. Great. Thank you. All right. Sure. You can see um, it, yes. So this um, is our um, crest and logo, Corpus Christi Academy. Um, there's some information on our website, which I've also put on the slide down here if you want to uh, write it down real quick. Um, you can go check out more information about the crest and the history. This is a Canterbury cross. Um, which is consistent with the patrimony of the ordinariate being specifically uh, within the Angl an Anglican Rite uh, parish. Um, our motto, which I will butcher in Latin, but hopefully my <laughs> kids will say it right, quecumque uh, sunt vera, is whatever is true. Um, and so we're, we're starting with um, this fall and uh, the Diocese of Charleston has leased us uh, what is the former um, Bicentennial Campaign offices. And um, I think sure. somebody was talking about that recently who used to, to be a part of that campaign. Well, Patricia said she was, yeah. Right. And that's behind the, so, what is currently Catholic Charities, what was formerly West Chancery. Um, so that's gonna be the location for the first uh, few years. And um, we're gonna start this fall with a homeschool hybrid. Um, and what that means is the kids will come, and this will be just ninth grade uh, for this coming fall. 
they'll come two days a week and um, but they, it'll be a full curriculum, but a lot of the material they'll have to be doing on their own and working through on their own at home for those kind of other three days. And then the next year, you know, our plan is kind of phase two will be a ninth and 10th grade and that will be full like opening for, um, you know, four okay. to five days a week uh, for, the, for the kids to be in the school themselves. Um, and then by 2024, we would have four grades, and that's kind of our third phase, uh, ninth through 12th grades. Again, um, Aaron talked a little bit about this, but um, what classical education is and what it's about, and we certainly can answer some more questions about that to the best of our ability um, when we have time for questions in a couple minutes. Um, I'll show you next a copy. Um, so this is the landing page for our website. Um, and um, our um, motto is igniting a lifelong love of learning. So again, the goal of classical education is not really to, to tell kids what to think or what they need to learn, but to teach them how to learn and specifically to pursue the things that are good and true and beautiful in this world. Part of my whole desire for this is thinking back on my own education and what I felt was lacking from it um, and hoping to give that to my kids. And that's um, really this idea of an integrated intellectual pursuit of the good, the true, and the beautiful. And um, I'm, you know, that's part of kind of where I'm coming from. It's like, I want my kids to be educated like the founding fathers were and like um, the great saints of our church were. Mm -hmm. and, um, and frankly, like most Catholics were educated until around, I'd say the 50s or 60s. Um, and so this is an effort to um, recapture that great tradition within the Catholic church of classical education. It's been, um, it's been really interesting talking to people of our age who are parents or educators because no one our age was was educated like this and everybody wishes they were everyone we talked to and so it's actually been difficult finding um we have hired um one faculty member who's been heading up our efforts so far and she was classically educated which is like finding a unicorn uh at this time because not many people even know what it is in our generation um but almost unanimously every parent that we've talked to said why wasn't i educated like this what i always felt like something was missing from my education which cody and i have talked about we had talked about for a long time before we even stumbled on a classical education we'd always felt like there was something missing and that's what we're hearing universally from other parents too all right, and then um, we did want to make a quick announcement. We do, so this um, Sunday is the Feast of Corpus Christi, as I'm sure most of you know. Um, for us, as the Corpus Christi Parish, that's our titular feast, the Feast audio. of Title. What's that? I'm going to go join on audio. Okay. And um, so we're going to obviously have a big mass for that. Our mass is at 11 at St. Mary's. And then after that, we're going to host a parish picnic and kind of an open house for the building to the school. Uh, for anybody that wants to come, it's uh, bring BYOP, that's bring your own picnic, um, and we'll be uh, there about one o'clock, I think is when we'll all kind of arrive from the parish. We'd love to have you um, come to the mass uh, and, and worship with us, and then, um, or, and or join us for a picnic at uh, the, the location for the future school. You know, one thing I think that I was really glad Frank um, talked to us, invited, talk. invited us to um, to speak, and um, I think that we all need to take notice of is um, where is um, retention of the faith going, and how is it working? Um, and so I'm going to share one more slide for you, which has been a bit of a motivator for me and for us about starting the school. Um, so this is a Gallup poll, and this is just church attendance, right? For Catholics since 1955. 
And, um, you know, I, we're all here in different demographics here, but none of them, as far as regular church attendance, this is just somebody who went to church in the last week, none of this is going the right way. Um, and for us, we feel called as the primary educators of our kids, um, but also as um, lay, you know, people in the church. Uh, and I was inspired by Sister um, Pamela Smith's talk last month about the role of the lady and the importance of the laity. One of the primary kind of texts that was formative for me in my faith was reading a letter by St. Uh, John Paul II. It's uh, Christi Fidelis Laici, which is on Christ's faithful lay people. And it's a whole letter dedicated to the role of the lady, laity, and I would encourage you to read it. And this, the unique way that was unexpected for Aaron and I that we think is fulfilling our call, call and role um, as lay people in the faith is education. Uh, one, because we have that direct role as parents, um, but also uniquely in this call to start a school. And what we hope um, is that um, helping kids grow up and learn at a young age how to learn and to follow um, the good, the true, and the beautiful can help reverse some of these trends that are not great as far as church practice among uh, millennials um, and now what is now called the nuns um, and, and also turn around this church attendance among Catholics, um, especially in a younger generation. I think it's probably also an answer to John Paul's call um, for the new evangelization. Um, I think this is our unique little way and role that God has called us to be a part of it. But clearly um, the church, you know, in the United States, we're doing some, something wrong. Um, when this many Catholics are not going to mass. And we need to try different things um, and new things uh, to reverse this. Um, and one of the, the parts about, you know, for, for education really, education historically is a means of evangelization. Anybody that knows anything about Catholic education knows that that is, that is the truth um, and so we hope to, to play a small part, um, our little small part um, in this through starting Corpus Christi Academy. Um, and I think that's about it that we have for presenting um, Frank's and Frank, obviously we're, we'd love to answer any questions or, or try to give more information if anybody wants more. But thank you guys for listening. Cody, thank you so much. Aaron, thank you very much for that. That was uh, that was wonderful, and I, I I think timely. I mean, I think that that chart uh, speaks to a larger challenge for all of us. And and I I would just start off by um, um, by reflecting on that chart. Uh, we talked about that a little bit um, before this when we had uh, a chance to speak together, but. Um, you know, one of the challenges for, for Catholic schools uh, is that, you know, there was a time when they could rely on a subsidized workforce, you know, among, among their faculty, uh, religious, uh, you know, sisters and brothers who, you know, didn't have to support families of their own. Uh, and, you know, that made it much more affordable to provide, um, you know, an education um, and, and accordingly kind of sustain the faith much more um, vigorously than it appears now. Um, Catholic schools, because they have to, you know, um, pay for teachers uh, who, who require more of an income, um, have found themselves, I think, in a challenge to, uh, you know, figure out how to, where, where to draw that line within the larger culture. How are you going to avoid that? Because you're going to have to, you know, unless unless you found an arrangement with the religious community, you're going to have to make those same kind of uh, of choices. So how that strikes me as a big challenge. How do you see addressing that? Yeah, I, I can. I, you hear me, Frank? Yes, yes, indeed. Thank you. Okay, I'm on the way to Myrtle Beach, but fully engaged here. Um, one thing 
that we would like to do is have an alternative um, funding model. So right now, if you go to Catholic school, um, you are paying thousands of dollars for one student. And if you have a large family, as many Catholics do, that can be, it can be cost prohibitive to go to school because you're paying for the rent and you're paying for the lights and everything and you're paying for all of those teacher salaries. Um, when we started out on this mission, our one of the very first bedrocks that we said is we want tuition to be affordable and actually affordable to large Catholic families because that's really who who's going to be interested in this project. We learned pretty quickly doing our first round of budget that uh, the cost to educate a child in a Catholic school is far much far more than we had anticipated, and so you know, we had to kind of circle the wags and wagons and say, well, what can we do about that? And our vision going forward is to form partnerships with individuals, businesses, anyone who really shares this vision with us of a classical education, a Catholic education that is intentionally ordered towards these children's souls, really. Um, Traditionally in Catholic school right now, you would pay tuition and then the parents who are paying tuition are also the same people in about 80% of the of the 80% of the time who are funding the fundraisers as well. So you're paying your $10,000 of tuition and then you are also paying for the gala ticket and paying for the auction items and paying for every other fundraiser that's there, which really makes up about 80% of the, of the fundraising budget. And we just said, we can't do that. We can't ask people to pay tuition and ask people to be our main fund, those same people to be our main fundraising base. So right now we are engaged in a full throttle fundraising effort called our Pelican Partnership. The Pelicans is our um, mascot for the traditional Catholic imagery that it provides of self-sacrifice. And um, it goes very well with, with Corpus Christi, the body of Christ, as we all are. But the Pelican Partners, that's what we're looking for. We are looking for a way to recapture that sense of this is a community effort. You know, the parish used to subsidize most of school because it could, and, and the parish can't do that anymore with rising costs. But, you know, as St. Paul said in Acts, we're all putting into the same purse at this point. And it's all of our responsibility to educate and evangelize the next generation to carry on the faith. And that's what we're looking for. Um, our goal is to raise a million dollars, $1 million uh, in this calendar year to jumpstart this effort and to really allow families, real families who wouldn't otherwise be able to pay for, you know, all of their kids to go to Catholic school, um, to make it a community effort to do that. I hope that answers some of what you were getting at, Frank. Uh, it does, it does, thank you. And, and, um, and, and because you both see this as an evangelization tool, you, you both see it as an opportunity to draw in, you know, children who may not come from Catholic families, but are looking for all of the elements of a classical education, too. So is, is that correct? Yes, uh, and we know many families who are interested in classical education, um, who I think would be interested um, in the school for that reason. Um, you know, it's one of the things we found interesting with what what we hear back as feedback from, from different people are, are different things. Some people are excited about a classical education. There isn't really an option in Charleston. Some people are excited about just a location in West Ashley. Um, some people are excited about a smaller school and not a kind of really big school. Um, where kids are going to get a little bit of a different experience than the kind of traditional modern high school. Um, so there's diff people are attracted in different ways. And so I do think and I hope that we will have, you know, non-Catholics attracted for some of these other reasons, maybe, 
um, but who are also willing to um, learn about, you know, our um, the Catholic Church and to have their kids um, educated um, in an excellent way um, where they learn, you know, more about the faith as well. Well, please jump in with questions here because I, I could uh, spend all all the time we have uh, asking my own. So we could spend all day talking, Craig. <laughs> and so I welcome a question, but if there isn't one, I don't want to leave. Uh, uh, I don't want to leave uh, time. So well, Doctor uh, Tolly. Oh, I'm sorry. It's Noreen. Well, I have, oh, Noreen. I let Noreen go first. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> well, this is more of a comment plus a question. I wish I had multiple time, but um, I listen in the morning sometimes to this sh uh, talk show with um, Hugh Hewitt, and he always has the Hillsdale College dialogues, and I realize how ignorant I am of history. Mm -hmm. So I'm just throwing this out there. Um, you may include a an adult education track. You might get people <laughs> that want, want to learn. Just mention it. Yeah, yeah I, I would love that. This whole, the last five years has been a huge education for me and I've, I've loved it. I, I would say too is, you know, that is a hope for us is that this would be a community of learning that's broader than, right, than just the in-class in instruction. And, and I think one of the things that we have come to recognize with like our target kind of students are going to be students and families, you know, who read, who want to read um, and to broaden their, their own particular education. And so, um, you know, I think we've, we've talked about book clubs for, you know, adults and parents um, within the school. Um, so we have some ideas about that I think would be, you know, mesh well with that, that idea as well. I can't help but, but just interject with one thing about reading here. I was at a, uh, a retirement party for a college professor at the College of Charleston last week. And uh, he was, not, you know, he, he, he had this great reputation of having these just enormous, enormous syllabi for his classes. But he talked about over the course of his, you know, 25 year career, basically reducing and condensing his uh, syllabi because he, the students just, you know, today are not reading uh, at anywhere near the level they were before. So this notion of kind of building in reading early on and creating that expectation is, is very important. Dolly, uh, Dr. Tolly? Well, there's a couple of things here. Um, you were talking about Father Allen. Is he, yes. is he planning to stay involved with this? Uh, yes, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Yes, Father. Go ahead. Uh, so the the school Corpus Christi Academy will be a parish school. Um, the ordinariate uh, is a essentially a non territorial diocese. Uh, diocese, mm -hmm. um, and so um, not only do we have the blessing of uh, Bishop Guglielmone and um, a letter of support from him, but our own Bishop Bishop Lopes, who's in Houston. Um, we will be uh, legally a parish school under the ordinaria. Um, so Father Allen uh, will basically, he will be the, the man in charge on the ground, um, although obviously we'll be delegating to um, a board of directors, but also a headmaster. And the ordinary um, I, is uh, out of Rock Hill, uh, up there by Winthrop. No, this... Um, is the ordinary the chair the ordinary the chair of St. Peter, um, which is out of Houston. Okay. And um, if you look at our website, um, you should there should be a link to the ordinary its website as well. The ordinary the ordinary is I think in Rock Hill, which yeah. is yeah the brothers and um, uh, monks up there. And so um, Father, Father Allen used to be at Holy Communion on Cannon and Rutledge Avenue, Cannon yes. Ashley Avenue. And of course, um, the founder of Porter Military Academy um, was um, the priest, or uh, the Episcopal priest, um, Dr. Anthony Porter, 
who founded Porter Military Academy, uh, which is now you know the foregore of Porter Military of uh, Porter Gal, right. and was founded okay. for um, for the orphans of the Civil War there on Ashley Avenue. I thought that was an interesting wow. parallel. Um, the other thing, have you have you been in contact with an accreditation uh, organization like the Southern um, um, what is it, Southern College? Have you talked to any of those folks? Yes, uh, not. I don't know about the one that you're talking about in spe uh, specifically. We will be accredited. The accreditation, and I actually have kind of spearheaded figuring out part of that. Um, that process takes two or three years. Um, so we will be starting that process next year um, so that by the time we finish our first class um, who graduate as um, 12th graders, we should be accredited by then. We're um, looking at a couple different ones. There's an association of classical Catholic high schools. Um, and then there's also a, um, I think it's called the Classical Latin Association. Um, so it, it, there's a couple different options yet. Um, I'm not sure that we picked one uh, as a board yet, uh, but I'm sure we'll be doing that within the next, you know, six months. And the last thing I was um, asking, want to um, look at was I didn't see anything about math and science in your um, curriculum there. Yes, math. Math and science are traditional liberal arts and they will most definitely be taught. Um, they are, it is actually possible to integrate your math and science studies to your history as well. But the math will go in a traditional order of Euclid geometry, algebra two or trigonometry, pre-calculus and calculus. And there will be a coordinating four year st uh, science study as well with labs. Yes. and and. From what I've read, one of my, my dad is a neuroscientist. I grew up um, in a science household. And one of the most convincing things that I read years ago when we started this journey is a professor of, of science saying, my best students were classically trained, not because they know the technicalities of science when they come to me, but because they know how to think. And I can teach them better than I can teach other kids, which I loved that. Um, one other, one other thought, Joe, would, when you asked if Father Allen would be involved still, um, the great thing about having a former Anglican as a priest is that he has two kids who are almost high school age themselves. So he will most definitely be involved um, on, as a parent and a priest in both ways. So, uh, you know, along the line, you know, the, the, these lines, I guess, you know, in, in uh, the kind of questions that parents might ask, um, what is, you know, how, how do you take parents through the steps necessary then to apply for colleges and universities, things like standardized testing and all of those things that college, is there a, how, how does a college look at a, a product of a classical education as they are weigh their admissions? And how do you talk about that with, uh, with parents? Cody, do you wanna go ahead? Why don't you start and I'll fill in. Okay. Um, colleges love classically educated uh, kids. They love classical schools because they're new and, and innovative. And what they are getting is children who know, or students at that point, who know how to think and write. Students who know how to write are uh, unicorns these days. In fact, our, our head of school, Dr. Nicole Koopman, she came to us from the College of Charleston History Department. And she said, what made her want to get out of higher ed and get back to secondary ed was that the students she had did not know how to read or write. And she wanted to go back and help form the generation of students going back into college and help them learn how to write. So yes, from what I hear in the research and talking to uh, you know, uh, the schools who have gone before us in this venture, colleges love applications from classical schools. Now, we are not going, our goal is to educate the souls of these children and educate their minds and their hearts 
that's to say that we are not going to be teaching them to a test. We are not an achievement-based school. However, acknowledging that classical education produces some of the highest scores on the SAT and ACT because these kids know how to do math and they know how to think and they know how to read. So yes, the outcomes look very good for classically educated children. The other thing that colleges look at um, so I am told at this point is the transcript. They want to see interesting things on a, on a transcript. These kids will have one of the most rigorous educations that you can see on a transcript and colleges love seeing that. Um, our kids will take the SAT and the ACT. They will take AP tests where applicable, uh, but we are going to be more concerned about the formation of their souls before their SAT scores. Having said that, I fully expect all of our kids to go to college, um, all of the kids from this school. It will be a college preparatory course. And in some ways, a, a college class may even be easier after they get out of our classes. Go ahead, Cody. Uh, you pretty much covered everything that I was going to say. So that's okay, what I <laughs> Thanks. Other questions? Well, I'll throw um, out it. Oh, I'm sorry. Fire away. I, no, that was, it was just me, Aaron, um, saying one thing that we we could use help with. Actually, um, we are always looking for time, talent, and treasure, and for volunteers um, and prayers. We would really appreciate the just prayers for success for this venture. But also, if you have time and you feel called to this, like we have been, if you feel like this is like you're hearing this today and you're like, yes, this is what's been missing. I do want to add another option to the Catholic education in Charleston. Um, we could use volunteers for, for time, your skills. We could use volunteers for your wisdom who have, who have some business acumen to offer. And um, one area that we are learning, Cody and I, very quickly is fundraising. And, um, you know, I talked about it a little bit, our alternative model, but, you know, if you have expertise in that area or you have wisdom or advice, we would love to sit down with you, you know, off of this call sometime. Um, and that's just in order to pull this off, we need a comprehensive fundraising plan, which we have, but we could use some help executing it. Well, we'll put uh, we'll put information out about this uh, uh, when we when we share the video of this session, and uh, obviously a link to your website, and um, you know we'll include that. Let me, let me just ask you know uh, another question as it relates to evangelization, and that is, you know, obviously um, you know uh, Catholics need to evangelize their Catholic brothers and sisters, who, um, as we know, uh, many are, have fallen away. Uh, but, you know, in terms of reaching out to, um, uh, you know, underserved communities and all that, you know, we, we talked about this a little bit with your efforts to make this affordable, but will, will that be a part of, um, you know, for, for you particularly, Cody, I mean, you, you know, you live on the, you know, every day in, 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 in the area that is the result of, of uh, the continued underserving of uh, segments of our community. How, how do you see reaching out to those um, to those young souls uh, to get them on a track that uh, can lead to something uh, positive and uh, fulfilling for the soul and uh, hopeful for our community. Yeah, thanks, Frank. And I think um, that the level of, I mean, I, we truly believe that this type of education is good for, for, um, for all kids. Um, and um, I think that what we, um, you know, there's a strong, as I said, there's a strong history of evangelization as a part of the Catholic education mission. Uh, and we certainly believe that as well. And so, um, and I'll also say just in my own experience, um, dealing with the poor and working with the poor, you know, there are, um, I don't believe that the government can solve uh, systemic problems with poverty um, and lack of education. 
and um, they, there are things we can do better um, as uh, just kind of a, at the level of local government, state government, um, and we should do those things. Um, but I really think that true change of families and culture are going to come through um, people who sacrifice um, for the good of other people and serving the poor. And um, I think for schools and for education like that are that are Catholic, that that's a almost a prerequisite that we would create spaces for um, those who are um, are poor in that through scholar. I mean, you know, historically that's done through scholarships. Um, and so I think that that is something we're still going to work through and figure out. Um, and you know, we want this education to be available to everyone and not a barrier for anyone. And so, um, you know, we're open to um, finding those new ideas. And, and Frank, you know, you gave us some good ones, I think. Um, and so I think that that is going to be something that we continue to develop as we grow um, and that we need to um, keep in mind, um, you know, the, the, the entire purpose really for the school is evangelization. Um, and that is for our own kids, um, but for any kid who has um, a desire to, to learn and, lo and to learn how to learn. Um, so um, we're hopeful that we can, you know, work with people to establish those partnerships. So this is an affordable option for everybody. Thank you. Any other questions? I got one other statement here. Um, you know that um, Corpus Christi Diocese in Pooler is one of the newest parishes of the Diocese of Savannah. It's Corpus Christi um, Church. And their long-term plan is to have a, um, a school there um, in Pooler. I do not know what Corpus Christi Parish um, school will be named, but it may be um, another school in the, uh, in the next 10 years named Corpus Christi um, in Pooler. Well, thank you for that. Uh, we've got the website already, so we can help them find another domain, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> There's actually one other one in Ohio that got our first website choice, but we got one. So maybe we can reach out and be pen pals with them. Well, the, the, the body of Christ is all encompassing, so. Any, uh, any other questions? Well, Cody and Aaron, I just wanna thank you so much for taking your time and sharing, uh, sharing your faith journey, sharing your work uh, uh, on behalf of uh, Christ and his, uh, his body. And um, I wanna thank you also for uh, the time you put in uh, as parents, as, uh, as, uh, as Catholic leaders in our community and as, uh, as, as educational entrepreneurs as you're finding yourselves to be. So, so thank you for that. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, again, for this um, uh, first Friday gathering, we are going to um, suspend these as we always do for July and August and resume them on September 3rd. And we're delighted that we'll be uh, gathering in person at the Pastoral Center of the Diocese uh, 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 Chancery Complex uh, in West Ashley. We'll also be recording these. Um, this month, we have uh, our uh, rosary gathering on the 17th of June at seven o'clock at uh, St. John Cemetery in memory of the uh, martyred souls of uh, Mother Emanuel and the souls of St. John Cemetery. And then on uh, Sunday, the 27th of June, we uh, are renewing the Fun Nun Bowl. And uh, it's a great family fellowship opportunity and uh, hope that, uh, that you all be able to, to join us for that and put out some teams for that. So you can find out more information about all of that on our website. And we'll be posting this video on our website uh, shortly as well. So uh, with that, I wanna thank everybody and uh, wish you uh, the Lord's blessings and a, a great summer. Thank you so much, Frank, and everyone for having us. And um, please do be in touch. 
either you know our email or the website whatever um but please do be in touch we like we said this is a community effort and we really really hope for it to to be a, a community celebration of education here so thank you so much for listening to us and our project thank you thank you god bless everyone have a wonderful afternoon thank you